Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Professor Dr. Avinash Tadic. I am the Dean of Institute of Legal Studies and Research, GLA University, Mathura. Today, students, we are going to talk about something very fundamental because we believe that literacy must be in every area. When I say literacy, it does not mean that only reading and writing, but literacy can be language, literacy can be financial literacy. Uh, linguistic literacy and there is another type of literacy I always call that legal literacy. Do you understand the Indian legal system? Do you understand what is civil and criminal uh, laws in India, how it works in India? Because when you are going to work for a company, uh, junior level, mid level or senior level, you will encounter many situations where your legal team and compliance team will tell you sir we have got some civil uh, law issues, civil case has, has been filed against us or uh, we have got some criminal issues and uh, sometime even you will see that uh, criminal cases uh, are being filed not against the company but even their senior management and the officials. So then in that scenario uh, an individual business manager or a leader should understand the basics of civil and criminal law and legal system in India. So, in our lecture 4, we will talk about Indian legal system, civil and criminal. So, before going to legal system, I would like to say few words more about the law and law in general. Why do we have laws? First, you need to understand as a, a business person, as an individual person that laws are to protect uh, your life, when I say life means your body and then law is supposed to protect your property and finally law is supposed to protect your dignity, your reputation. Okay, so these are the three things uh, laws are protecting and uh, when there is a harmony in society where there is no conflict in society, we really, we really do not need any legal system, but that is not the situation. The situation is that people do fight for over the property, over the money, financial issues and uh, then there are some cases where even the personal life and your body is also uh, under attack. Okay? And what you expect from the state or from the government that when I am a law abiding citizen and if someone is violating my privacy, my life, my property, uh, what can I do? And if the legal system is not able to protect your life, your body and your reputation and privacy, then obviously you have no faith in that particular legal system. Okay? So, and then there is another thing, one is law has to define what is right and what is wrong. In our previous lectures, we discussed about ethics, we discussed about moral values. Ethics and moral values, uh, they are also very important, no doubt, but they keep changing from one place to another place uh, within India, outside of India and even within the given society, uh, people can have different ethical and moral values. So, sometimes it is difficult to understand what is right and wrong in ethics and moral, but that is not the situation with law. When I say something is legal or illegal, you can go and read the text, you can read the law and the law will tell you what is civil wrong, what is criminal wrong. Okay? So, first law defines what is right and what is wrong. Okay? And once it is defined what is right and what is wrong, then issue arises that who will decide that who is wrong and who is right. Okay? First we say, what is right, what is wrong. Like for example, suppose if I take your mobile without your permission, 
Okay. So, first we need to see whether it is right or wrong, whether it is legal or illegal. So, law will say sorry, this is a theft. Okay. Theft without your permission, without your consent, if I take your mobile, let us say theft. And if I say please give me your mobile, otherwise I will kill you, that is an extortion. Okay. So, first you have to define a particular act okay, or even omission. You know, so law defines both act and omission. Act means that you are doing something, omission means that you are supposed to do something, but you are not doing. Okay. So, that can be also a legal action. So, first law will tell you okay, this is theft or this is extortion. Okay. Then, because when something happened in society, obviously judges, police, uh, they are not there. Okay. It happens maybe in, in a room or somewhere where the uh, legal system enforcement people are not there. So, then you go to a police station and you say okay, someone has just stolen my mobile. So, but nobody knows whether it is right or wrong, whether it is a truth or false. So, the police will do investigation. Okay. Police will do investigation, then police will collect evidences and on the basis of their uh, evidence and investigation, they will go to court and finally, judge will decide whether uh, that person has committed crime or not. Okay. So, this is very complex process sometime, but if you see it is a rational, because we really do not know whether someone has committed a crime or not until and unless we give him or her a fair opportunity to prove his or her innocence. Okay. That is very important. And then finally, suppose if you are not happy with the judge order, you believe that judge has made some error in judgment, uh, then you must have right to appeal. Okay. So, then you go to high court, then you go to supreme court. So, uh, when you understand the legal system, the civil and criminal, then it is easy for you to decide what is right, what is wrong. And if someone has taken something wrong against you, what type of legal resources you can take. Okay. So, th this is the background of legal system. It is not only Indian legal system, it is the entire legal system globally. So, let us talk about Indian legal system. Indian laws refers to the system of law which operates in India. So, you need to be very careful when I say Indian legal system means Indian laws are applicable only in India. There are few laws as we, uh, we have discussed, we will discuss, there are some laws uh, which have extra territorial jurisdictions. Extra territorial jurisdiction means like for example, cyber law. So, if someone commits a crime outside of India, someone is sitting in suppose UK and he is hacking an Indian computer or doing something which is affecting the Indian people. In that scenario, the Indian government or the police can file FIR against that person. Okay. And uh, we can uh, start a case against him, but this is a situation with very few laws. Mostly civil and criminal laws are local, local means national. Okay. So, what is legal may not be illegal and uh, what is legal in India may be illegal in some other country. Okay. So, you need to understand uh, when you live in a country that laws are applicable only in that particular country. Okay. And there are some international laws, international public law, international private law governed by the United Nations and those laws are applicable on all countries and all individuals. Okay. But that is not the subject matter of our chapter today. So, our laws are basically largely based on English common law. So, as you know that we were the colony of UK, so our laws more or less like all modern laws you see. Uh, Indian Evidence Act 1872, okay, Indian Police Act 1961. So, all the uh, Indian Evidence, uh, sorry, Indian Penal Code 1860. So, all these laws were made by the Britishers uh, during that time and uh, they were very much based on the uh, UK law. However, we made so many changes in last you can say 150 years. So, we have made so many drastic changes. However, the basic philosophy of Indian law, the basic structure of Indian law, basic reasoning of Indian law is very much uh, based on English common law. Okay. 
Various acts introduced by the British are still in effect and modified from today. Okay. So, those laws are still applicable in India with lot of modifications. Much of contemporary Indian law shows substantial European and American uh, influence. So, contemporary Indian law, when I say contemporary means the laws which we have made in last 20 years, 30 years. So, we have taken a lot of references from America and from other European countries. When I say European countries means Europe minus UK. Okay, so, our laws like even our Indian constitution is very much influenced by American constitution, French constitution, German constitution, Austrian constitution. So, you will find that so many other laws are also influencing Indian law and <clears throat> there is nothing wrong in it. You know, sometimes you feel oh, why our laws are influenced by uh, other countries. This is a natural process because all those countries they started making codification of law, written laws in the modern manner uh, before India. Okay. So, uh, if we can learn something from other countries, it is fine, but at the same time we need to integrate Indianness and the requirement of Indian society in those laws. Let us see little bit the history of Indian laws. Ancient India represented a distinct tradition of law. When, say, when I say ancient India means before the Britishers. Okay. India has a historical independent school of legal theory and practice like for example, Arth Sastra written by Chanakya uh, dating from 400 BC that means like 2400 years back and Manusmriti from 100 AD were influential treaties in India. So, in uh, Arth Sastra, in Manusmriti and so many other texts, legal texts our Indian society was governed by these things and they were very much independent from westerners influence because that time obviously, there was no uh, westerners influence and uh, even the Roman and the Greek empire or the other uh, Middle East and Mesopotamia, Chinese civilization, uh, they had their own system and India got its own system. Okay. So, it was very independent. Manu's central philosophy was tolerance and pluralism and was cited across Southeast India. So, we should not uh, underestimate the influence of these uh, Indian law philosophers because during that time India was one of the richest most influential country like for example, if I give the example of Nalanda and Takshila University uh, during the time they were the best universities in the world more than 10,000 students were from across the globe, you know when I say across the globe from the Europe, from Middle East, from uh, Greece, uh, from China and Southeast Asia, 10,000 students were studying in those universities, more than 1,000 or two, uh, sorry 2,000 professors were teaching in those universities and in those universities they used to teach philosophy, law, mathematics, medicine, religion, everything. Okay. So, you can see that our uh, Indian legal philosophers and the policy makers, they had lot of influence even in Southeast Asia. So, source of law. So, the primary source of law in the enactment passed by the parliament or the state legislature. So, we have different types of source of law, where source means where the law is coming from. Okay. So, the first is uh, the laws enacted by the parliament at the central level or laws enacted by the state legislatures as well as we have given some power to some local municipalities also. Okay. So, those people they are they, they are empowered to make laws okay. and that is their job also. Legislature means the politicians, the main job of politician is to make laws and the job of executive, the bureaucrats, government officers, their job is to implement that law. And the job of a judge or a judiciary is to interpret the law. If there is any conflict in the law, uh, if there is an, a different interpretation of law, you know, interpretation is required that uh, what does it mean basically. If we want, if suppose if there is a law and two parties are fighting, so that is not job of executives to tell them what is the interpretation of law, then they will go to the court and court will tell them in high court and supreme court that this is the meaning of law and as per their interpretation they will decide. Okay. 
the president and governor have limited power to issue ordinances. So, when I say limited power means that president and governors they can issue any they can make a law through the ordinance. Ordinance is a situation where the parliament and the lo state legislatures uh, they issue a ordinance which is effective as a law for 6 months and after 6 months that, that law uh, does not have any legal power, but they can continue with that new ordinance. So, if they uh, during the uh, session if they want to make a law they enact a act, but if their session is not running and if they need to make a law then they make the law through the president and the governor. These ordinances left six, six weeks from the reassembly of the parliament or the state legislatures. Secondary source, so the first source is coming from the president and the parliament and legislatures. Secondary source is judgment of the Supreme Court, High Court and some of the specialized tribunal. The constitution provides that law declared by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts within India. So, you need to understand when I say common law uh, tradition, the Euro, uh, the UK's, the British common law tradition. So, in the globe we have two uh, families, one is common law tradition and the second is civil law tradition. In common law tradition, it is not only the uh, parliament and the uh, politicians they make the law, even the high court and supreme court by interpreting the law or in case if there is a gap between two laws, they can also make the law through their judgments and those judgments, those laws are absolutely applicable in that country. So, that is a common law principle. In civil law countries, uh, courts are not empowered to make any law. So, they all laws are coming from the legislature, their job is just to uh, implement the law. But in India, high court, supreme court and specialized tribunals, they can also make law through their judgments. And this is very clear that it is given by the constitution, the supreme court judgment, if supreme court makes any law, if they issue any guidelines, that type of law is binding on all courts within the India, then they have to follow that judgment or that law as it is it is coming from the parliament or state legislature. Okay. So, the high court, supreme court, they can also make law in our country. So, legal system during British era, how the Britishers were uh, ruling this country through the law. The system of administration of justice and laws we have today are product of British rule in India, more or less, you know 90 percent, yes. Not less than four law commissions and committees were appointed by the British ruler during to give shape to the system. So, it's, it did not happen in one year, they took lot of time, uh, maybe like 30, 40, 60, 70 years, they took a lot of time to uh, understand the Indian system, introduce the, uh, the British system, integrate with the Indian requirements. So, it took lot of time even for them. The common law system means the system of law based on recorded judicial precedents came to India with British East India Company. So, recorded judicial precedent means that if in any particular dispute, if the high court or supreme court have given any particular judgment, so the other courts they will also give due respect to that judgment. Okay. So, in Indian situation, whenever we got some disputes, so we always looked at the uh, British courts so in that in particular point of law what the British courts have decided and then our Indian courts also followed the same approach. The company was gra uh, granted charter by King George I in 1726 to establish mayor's court in Madras, Bombay and Kolkata. So, they were the first courts established by the Britishers. Okay. Uh, you should not forget that even before the British period, during the Mughal period, they also established lot of courts and before the Mughal period, we used to have informal courts uh, by the king. Uh, but I think this was the time when the courts were established by the government, however, they kept a reasonable distance from the government. I think that is a difference. Okay. Here, the courts were very much independent to interpret the law 
and even sometimes people were filing cases against the British people, you know, against the British company also. So, uh, in that scenario, it was more like an impartial types of court, not completely, uh, but that was the beginning when the courts and the government they got separated. Following the first war of independence in 1857, following the first war of independence in 1857, the control of company territories in India passed to the British crown. The next big shift in the Indian legal system was to establish the Supreme Court replacing the existing Mayor's Court. So, that was the big change in Indian legal system after the 1857 when the British government decided that now the company will not run the uh, Indian territory and it will come under directly the British crown. So, instead of continuing with the Mayor's Court and they established Supreme Court in India. So, the doors for newly created Supreme Court were closed to the Indian practitioners, right to audience was also limited to the members of England, English, Irish and Scottish professionals. So, obviously they established Supreme Court, but they were very much limited to the Indian audience and Indian practitioners. When I say Indian practitioners means Vakil. I think maybe interesting to know for you that all these terms like the vakil, advocate, barrister, solicitor, they have different meanings. Now, in Indian context, they are all same, uh, we just have advocate. Okay. Officially, now we only have advocates, Advocate Act 1961. Okay. So, that law governs the advocate. Now, there is nothing called vakil or a solicitor or barrister in India. But before that period, during the British period, advocate was not there, there was a vakil, solicitor and barrister. So, vakils were Indians basically, they got education in India, legal education in India and they were entitled to practice only to lower courts. They could not appear in high court and supreme court. And the people who went to abroad, especially UK in London and they got their uh, solicitor and barrister, they are both se uh, separate degrees. Solicitors mainly can argue up to high court in UK and uh, they are mainly the drafters. They, they do lot of drafting, but they do not argue up to supreme court. Barristers, they are mainly uh, arguing counsel, they argue in the supreme court of UK and they also do drafting. So, during that period mainly Indians were involved as an uh, vakil in 1858. But gradually they started going abroad in UK and they start getting a uh, license of a barrister and solicitor. Okay. Later the Legal Practitioners Act which opened up the professional regardless of nationality or religion to all. These courts were later converted into the first high courts through letters of patent authorized by Indian High Courts Act passed by the British Parliament in 1862. During the British Raj, the Privy Council acted as the highest court of appeal. Cases before the council were adjud adjudicated by House of Lords. So, Privy Council was more like more or less like a Supreme Court and all these Supreme Courts earlier they were established in the Delhi, uh, sorry in Bombay, Kolkata and uh, Madras, they converted into high courts. Okay? And this Privy Council uh, mainly the House of Lords House of Lord is basically just like the Rajya Sabha in India. Okay. They are not elected members, they are selected members by the Queen. Okay. So, coding of law also began with forming of the first law commission. The IPC was drafted, you just see 1862 period, enacted and brought to into the force in 1862. The CRPC, when I say IPC means Indian Penal Code. The CRPC's criminal procedure code was also drafted by the same commission. Later in 1937, the federal court was established at Delhi. Okay. The right to appeal from the decision of the federal court, was, uh, federal court was granted to Privy Council in London. So, if you want to appeal against the high courts in India, then that time you had to go to the London uh, for the Privy Council. Because the Privy Council was hearing lot of appeals from all colonies, not only India, but all colonies. So, let us talk about the Indian judicial system now. The three tiered system of Indian judiciary comprises of Supreme Court at the New Delhi at its the top level, then high courts standing at the head of the state judicial system 
and then followed by district and session courts in the judicial districts into which the states are divided. Okay. So, this is very then the lower uh, uh, rung of the system the district court that comprises of courts of civil, civil judges and criminal, judicial and metropolitan magistrates. So, at the top level there is only one supreme court in India that is in Delhi. Then in almost all states they have high courts and those high courts are mainly deciding the issues within that particular state. Okay. And then every district there is a district and session court headed by a district judge and then uh, below the district judge there are additional district judge, CMM, chief, Metrop chief uh, judicial magistrate, CJM in some states they call it CJM, chief judicial magistrate in Delhi they call it CMM, chief metropolitan magistrate. And uh, then below CMM there are um, MM metropolitan magistrates or in uh, states we call them uh, judicial magistrates. Okay. And then we have divided their work into civil judges and criminal judges. So, this is how the entire Indian judiciary system works. Then apart from this classical judicial system, we have quasi judicial system also. This appendage to the Indian judicial system is a recent and sincere attempt on the part of the government to expedite the judicial process through dilution of the procedure formalities. So, mainly the objective is that there are so many expert uh, technical issues are emerging in India in last 30, 40 years. So, we had to create special courts and they are not like typical courts, they are like an expert courts, you know. Uh, when I say typical court means they are not expert in anything, you know, when I say civil means they are dealing with more than 100 laws. When I say criminal, they are dealing with more than uh, 200 types of criminal cases, okay. But when I say uh, quasi judicial system, special tribunals like for example, income tax appellate tribunal. So, that appellate tribunal dealing with only appeals from the commissioner of income tax. When I say consumer commission, national consumer commission, district uh, consumer commission, state consumer commission, national consumer commission. So, they are only dealing with, dealing with consumer disputes. Okay. So, this is how you will find there are more than 50 to 60 different types of uh, tribunals, commissions are uh, doing judicial work. You know, they are also using law like for example, if I give you simple example of consumer law. Suppose you want to file a consumer case. So, instead of going to a normal civil court, you have to go to the consumer court and consumer court is not. Uh, situated most of the time in the court room in, in the court area there is a separate entity and they work more in uh, informal manner you can understand when I say informal manner that lot of procedure formalities you know because in uh, courts they have there are lot of procedures you have to follow and sometimes because of those procedures uh, so many cases are taking time like you know 10 years 20 years 50 years so these specialized courts or the tribunals or commissions they are avoiding that type of thing okay like uh, uh, can we move quickly and even in some courts the presence of lawyer is also not required like for example in consumer court you don't need a lawyer you can go and argue okay because they are not very much technical in nature they don't follow too much uh, legalistic procedures they follow principle of natural justice and simple uh, process and then now we are creating interesting judicial system to avoidance of litigation even uh, the, the government is trying to create a mechanism where people can go and do the mediation, arbitration. Uh, we will talk about these things mediation, arbitration later on, but uh, in mediation, arbitration the idea is that can we avoid litigation or case like is it possible that both parties sit together and with the help of some expert we can solve their issue so that they do not go to a courtroom. Okay. So, this is the quasi judicial litigation process. So, generally there are two types of legal cases in India civil and criminal civil litigation. Uh, civil litigation is a lawsuit whereby a party seeks damages against another party. Okay. The damages means money, they want money. In civil cases, it is all about money, it is because um, um, civil means not criminal. So, in civil case, it can be property, it can be 
money uh, money issues it can be even family issues you know in family is also a civil litigation uh, the damages can come in the form of money or the modification of some type of conduct the first stage of civil litigation is the pleading stage the pleading stage simply refers to the filing of the complaint against the party that is the defendant so you file a case you know you just say okay this is the damage uh, this is the civil wrong he has done against me the next stage of civil litigation is discovery discovery is simply the process of learning what evidence each side has regarding the dispute so you have to prove you have to submit lot of evidences like both parties they share evidences and you need to understand in the law in civil cases you have to share your evidences with opposite party also and opposite party does the same thing so that both parties should know what type of evidences they are presenting before the court once discovery comes to a close the defendant will often file something known as a motion for summary judgment okay then defendant can also reply that okay whatever allegations you have made against me this is my reply in criminal litigation this is something different is uh, first you need to understand civil litigation is between two parties state or the government uh, have has nothing to do with this you know this is your personal matter you go to the court you file even the court fee the, the court will ask you to pay, uh, pay the fees also because this is your personal issue the government or the state has nothing to do with it okay the government the government through the judge is just trying to help you to solve your issue in a legal manner okay like for example if you believe that someone is not giving your money to you and this is a civil case okay if you believe that someone is encroaching your property then it's a civil case you can go and file the case okay but then both parties have to submit the evidences and they have to find their own lawyers the government doesn't help any party but in criminal litigation it's completely different a crime happens against the government or the state not to the individual so suppose if someone uh, hits you okay so the uh, and uh, the other part like the person's name is maybe x you know so the case will be filed against x but the name of the case will be x versus state of your state you know like state of up state of rajasthan state of west bengal state of tamil nadu it means that crime has hap, crime has committed against the state so the state will take care of this now the state will do the investigation state will uh, fight your case you can also be the part of this process but you are just a party in this dispute uh, the ultimate case will be fought by the government the criminal justice process typically begins when a police officer places a person under arrest okay so obviously if there is no fir or if there is no case by the government or by the judge then criminal litigation will not start after a criminal suspect is arrested the next step in the case are the processing of the person into police custody and determination of his eligibility for release from the custody in exchange for the posting of a set amount of money so we call it bail so first try to understand how it happens suppose if someone uh, hits you with a rifle or with something you know and you believe that you are hurt so you go to the police station even if you don't go to police station if someone informs the police police will come and then police will do the investigation so they will file a case if there is a uh, uh, cognizable non cognizable cases if there are pt offenses you have to file the case if there are serious offenses police can file the case without your approval suppose murder happens so police doesn't wait for someone to file the case police will file the case then they will start the investigation then someone has to file fir either you file the fir or police will file the fir itself fir is a first information report okay so you need to understand the law of fir very simply that in fir nothing is being proved fir is just information given to the police officer that this is the information i am giving to you 
and then in that information you can write someone's name, you have to write the complete details, what happened, when happened, why happened and everything whatever you want to write, you write. Because at that stage nothing is uh, proven or not proven. So then on the basis of FIR, uh, the police will appoint one IO, investigating officer and that IO will start the investigation. Okay? So now the job of IO is to find the truth. Okay? He will do the investigation. If there is a serious offence, they may arrest that accused also. I am saying accused, not the criminal because right now we really do not know whether he has committed that crime or not. So, they can arrest him. If they arrest him, then they have to present that guy before the judge within 24 hours. That is written in the constitution of India. They cannot detain him in the police station for more than 24 hours. Within 24 hours, and when 24 hours starts, because whenever they arrest him, they have to enter into the police diary. Okay. In the police diary, every day they have to maintain a diary in a police station. So, any in or out, whatever happens in the police station, they have to mention in that diary. So, in that diary, if they mention that we went to there and we arrested that person at 11 a.m., it means that next day by 11 a.m., that guy must be before the magistrate. Okay. So, sometimes they do that, they do not mention in the diary, they mention after some time. So, I am just giving this, this, this thing because you can use that resources, you know, that within 24 hours they have to present. Because only magistrate or judge can decide whether that person should be with police officer or in the jail. Right now, investigation is under process. We really do not know what happened. Police is doing investigation, but we have arrested that person because we believe that police needs to do proper interrogation from him. Okay. Police needs to uh, ask him what, what, how, where. So, he needs to be in police custody. But then the judge will decide whether that guy will be in police custody, we call it PC or the JC, the judicial custody. If the judge believes that this person does not need to be with the police officer, then uh, okay. when that accused is presented before a magistrate within 24 hours, a magistrate uh, gets three options. First option, they can say, okay, this guy can go to jail, he is released on bail. Bail means that there is nothing to worry, you uh, deposit some money like the FD or anything, any property and you can go to home because the investigation is under process and you please cooperate with the police officer whenever they ask you to come. Okay, that is a bail. Second option they say, okay, police says now we want this guy in our custody because we want to interrogate him. So, the magistrate can give that guy in the police custody for maximum 14 days, not more than 14 days. After 14 days, again they have to come uh, to the magistrate and ask for the another round of police custody. If the magistrate says, okay, still you need, I believe it is required, then he allows police custody for another 20, uh, 14 days. Or magistrate believes that no police custody is not required. In that scenario, uh, no bail. If he feels no, uh, we cannot give him bail because he will uh, he can destroy some evidences, or he can influence evidences. The people in that scenario, magistrate can send him to JC. JC is judicial custody that we call it jail. So, he can go to the jail and he will stay in the jail and after every 14 days he will be presented before the magistrate and magistrate will again take a call whether he will be sent to the bail or PC or JC. Okay. So, this is how it works. Okay. Uh, so, during that time police officers uh, conducts their investigation and after a criminal defendant is formally charged with a crime the case proceeds to the trial phase. Then during the after the investigation, police has to uh, submit a charge sheet. In charge sheet, they can say that this crime has happened and this person has committed the crime or they can say this person has not committed the crime. So, they have to present before the magistrate. After a defendant is convicted or plead guilty, I will explain you what is plead guilty. Uh, a judge will decide on the appropriate punishment or sentence during the sentencing phase of the criminal case. Sentencing of a criminal case can range from prohibition 
and community service to prison and even the death penalty. It depends on the uh, punishment given in that particular section. So, when you read a section under IPC, IPC tells you what is the crime like uh, 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 defining the crime, what is theft and then, uh, then they will tell the punishment also that up to 7 years, up to 2 years, up to 10 years. So, they will tell the range also of the punishment that if someone commits a crime, he can go to jail uh, up to this period okay, or fine or both. Okay. So, there are three options for a magistrate. Indian criminal law is the law relating to criminal conduct in India. Okay. If you, if you uh, commit a crime outside of India, Indian courts cannot trial it. Okay. So, if you do any crime in Nepal and if you are in India, the Indian courts have no jurisdiction. Then the only option that Indian courts can deport that person if the Nepalese government want then they can deport that person, the guy will go to Nepal and then case will run in Nepal only. Same thing with Indians, if they are outside of India, uh, uh, yes, if they have committed a crime in India, yes, they can trial, uh, start the trial even without their presence. But if that guy has committed a crime outside of India and living in India, uh, Indian court cannot conduct a trial. Indian criminal laws are divided into three major states, the Indian Penal Code, Code of Criminal Procedure and Indian Evidence Act. Beside these three major acts, special criminal laws are passed by Indian parliaments like NDPC that uh, deals with the drugs, Prevention of Corruption Act that deals with the corruption and uh, investigation by the CBI, Food uh, Alteration Act, Dory Prevention Act and so many like more than 200, 300 types of laws deals with the criminal activities. So, IPC provides a penal code for all Indian including Jammu and Kashmir where, where it was renamed the uh, Ranbir penal code earlier, but after 370 now there is only IPC. Indian code was IPC was passed under the chairman of Lord Macaulay and was enforced in 1862. So, Lord Macaulay not only enacted the Indian education policy, but even the Indian penal code. Lord Macaulay uh, issued clarification for the people for India implementation of this code because people were of the view that the rule of capital punishment will be misused against them. The, uh, so, the code applies to any offence committed by an Indian citizen anywhere and on any Indian registered ship or aircraft. Anyway, this came to force. It has 23 chapters and 500 sections. It covers any Indian citizen or a person of Indian origin. The provision of this code applies also to any offence committed by any Indian citizen of India in any place without and beyond India, any person or any ship or air aircraft registered in India where it may be any person in any place without or beyond India committed offence targeting a computer resource located in India. That is a cyber crime. Okay, so, if you do a cyber crime outside of India targeting India, they can file case against you. Okay. Stages under idea uh, IPC that if uh, IPC means crime. So, first you have an idea that I want to kill someone. Okay. So, that idea itself is not punishable, you can have all crazy ideas. But once you start preparing to implement your idea, that will become a process of illegal act like for the killing someone if you start buying weapon then it can be illegal thing. Then if you attempt it then attempt maybe you are not able to succeed you know you want to kill someone, but you are not able to kill it is a serious injury only. So, attempt to murder can also be there okay. then you complete your act you really commit a crime. So, these three activities can be punishable thought and idea it means the only intention is not important okay, like mens rea they call it mens rea means state of mind that is not punishable. If you say ki that guy wanted to kill me, but he said yeah I wanted to kill you, but that is not the criminal offence in India. If you do not commit a crime, if you do not attempt a crime, if you do not prepare for a crime, crime there is no crime at all. Some important sections just like an example waging or attempting a wage war under section 121. 144 unlawful assembly armed with de deadly weapon, 300 is, 300 is murder. So, murder is defined under section 300. 
Section 302 talks about the punishment. 420 is like cheating and cheating type of cases, 376 is rape, 498 is lorry. So, you can see when you read IPC, you can clearly see crime against property, crime against person, crime against state, you know. So, you will see all different types of categories of crime and you can understand and read very carefully. Even they have given illustrations also like to explain a particular crime, they will give, they give some examples. So, if you read those examples, you can understand very well whether uh, this particular act is crime or not. Let us move to the criminal procedure code. The criminal procedure code is important once we define that someone has committed a crime, but how to run the trial, how police will do investigation, because we cannot give absolute power to police and judiciary, because then they can abuse it. So, we have created some rules for the police and for the judiciary that how to do investigation and how to run a trial. So, the CRPC is the main legislature on procedure for administration of substantive criminal law in India. It came in uh, 1973 and 74. It provides machinery for the investigation of crime, apprehension of suspected criminals, collection of evidence, determination of guilt or innocence of the accused person and the determination of the punishment of the guilty. At present, the act contains 484 and 56 forms. The sections are divided into 37 chapters. So, recent procedure like recent changes you can see a plea bargaining is included in criminal cases. So, pre plea bargaining was introduced in India 2005. This affects cases in which the maximum punishment is for 7 years. So, what is plea bargaining? The idea is that if you believe that you have committed a crime and you do not want to go for a full trial because you know that you have committed a crime and you want to admit it, so that you get less punishment. So, before the trial commence, if you do and do a plea bargaining, you plead guilty, yes I have committed this crime, I am very sorry for that, then in that case the judge can reduce your penalty. Okay. So, this is a good a win win situation for both if you believe that ultimately you are going to suffer. So, it is good to suffer right now rather than the double or triple. So, in some cases even the judges ask them to leave just you know paying some amount or some minimum uh, penalties. However, offenses affecting the socio economic conditions of the country and offenses commi committed against a woman or a child below the age of 14 are excluded. If you do any such type of crime, crime against woman or child below the age of 14, in those offenses you cannot commit the plead guilty. Okay? So, plead guilty is not possible in all types of crime, but in some crimes you can do it. So, you have to see whether a particular offense is eligible for plead guilty or not. The next one is Indian Evidence Act. Now, what is the role of Indian Evidence Act? <coughs> How a judge will decide whether a person has committed a crime or not? Okay. So, there has to be some rules to understand the evidences available to the judge. Judge cannot decide arbitrary what is admissible evidence, what is not admiss admissible evidence. Okay. So, there are different categories, different level and the value of evidences under uh, section 18, uh, sorry, uh, Law Indian Evidence Act 1872. So, Indian Evidence Act originally passed in India by the Imperial Legislative Council in 1872 governing the British Raj contains a set of rules blah 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 and so 11 chapters, 167 sections and came into force on 1 1st September 1872. It is applicable on all part of India. And it applies to all judicial proceeding in or before any court including court martial. So, this is very very fundamental very important law you need to understand evidence law very carefully. Like for example, there is a provision in Indian Evidence Act that any statement or any confession given to a police officer is not admissible in the court. Why? Because it is written in Indian Evidence Act, you know it is the judge has no power to decide whether you know you have given some confession or the statement to the police officer 
that you have committed a crime. If you signed any document in the police custody, that is that basically that has no value in the eyes of law in the courtroom. So, you will find there are different rules, regulations, sections relating to evidence act and evidence act is very crucial because at the end of the day judge will decide whether you are guilty or not guilty or you have taken money or not, you have some civil liability or not, everything will be based on the evidence. Uh, sometime maybe it is against the justice system, when I say justice means like the ultimate truth, but uh, as you can understand very clearly that judges are not present everywhere. Okay. So, they have to decide a case or a dispute based on written uh, evidences. So, now there can be direct evidences, indirect evidences, they give more value to direct evidences they give less value to indirect evidences or circumstantial evidences. So, judge has to apply his mind whether a particular law uh, is satisfied with this evidence or not, but not to affidavit present to any court or officer and not to proceeding before an arbitrator. Okay. So, uh, in some areas we have exempted evidence law, we say ki in some simple proceeding we want to make it simple. So, in arbitration for example, evidence is not applicable. Now, what does it mean by evidence? All oral evidences such as a statement, narration, showing mark of injury, tampering, all documents including electronic records produced for the inspection of the court are called documentary evidence. So, they are the, they are very valuable okay. and then uh, the first one. In case of oral or documentary evidence, documentary contained in electronic form is also tenable by the court. If, if there is a dispute between uh, oral or documentary evidence, the judge will give more value to documentary evidence than the oral document. Like oral, all facts except the content of the documents may be proved by oral evidence. Suppose like the oral evidence, you say that this guy uh, asked me that he will return uh, my 10 lakh rupees after 6 months. So, this is an oral. And now I am bringing maybe two uh, independent witnesses and they say, yeah, we were present there. So, this is oral evidence. But if you can produce a document like an email where that guy is writing very clearly or maybe he is signing a document uh, that he is saying that yes, I will give you 10 lakh rupees after 6 months. Okay. So, in that scenario, this oral uh, um, evidence will have less value rather than the documents. But in the absence of uh, documentary evidences or that the direct evidences, we have to rely on indirectly evidences like the oral evidences or circumstantial evidences. Then civil procedure code, the way criminal procedure code regulates the criminal proceeding in the same manner the CPC civil procedure code 1908 uh, regulates the civil cases, you know civil litigation. So, the civil procedure code regulates the functioning of civil courts, CRPC regulates the criminal courts and the police. The code of CPC is a procedure relating to administration of Indian civil procedure, a study of civil procedure is a study of procedures that applies in cases and not in criminal, they are, they are purely for civil cases. Civil trials can be used by anyone to enforce, redress or protect their legal rights through court orders and monetary awards. Okay. So, through the civil trials you can protect your property okay, or uh, you can even go for monetary awards also like someone has done something wrong against you, then you can go for the compensation under the CPC. It lays down procedure of filing the civil case, power of courts to pass various orders court fee and stamps involved in filing of cases, jurisdictions and parameters of civil courts functioning, specific rules for proceeding of a case, right of appeal, review or reference. So, as I told you that civil cases are purely between two parties and judges are just acting to resolve that issue, but it is a very complicated. So, in that scenario the CPC tells about the jurisdiction of the court that who will decide what you know and the appeal procedure, reference procedure, review procedure, how to file a case, how much court fee is required to pay, the entire civil litigation procedure is governed by CPC, civil procedure code. 
it lays down the procedure of the filing the civil case, procedure of court to pass various orders, court fee and step involved in filing of the case, rights of the parties to the case like the plaintiff and defendant, jurisdictions and parameters of civil court functioning like, like up to this level you can go to this court, above that level you will go to that court. So, you will this everything will be decided by the CPC. Recent trend in law like mediation and conciliation encouraged. So, like instead of going for civil cases, why do not you sit down and solve your cases, you know your dispute through some expert mediation and conciliator. So, that happens within the guidance of the court, but that is not a litigation. Okay. Number of adjournment and government is trying to restrict that. Uh, adjournment is basically a party is going and saying that I need more time to present this uh, document that present my uh, family is not feeling well some you know excuses good or bad this is how they prolong the civil uh, litigation. So, government is trying to put only three adjournment on each day. Service of summons by another means or so now the summon it is a very tricky issue to issue, uh, uh, issue the summon in India. So, you can the courts are issuing someone through the WhatsApp through email also. Evidence by way of affidavits and time limits to pronounce judgments. Okay. So, these are the new developments which we are uh, seeing in uh, uh, thing and then finally, new trends in judiciary uh, computerization of courts, scope of PIL is, PIL is being limited, public interest litigation. It is not like that anybody can go and file the PIL for everything. Now, the Supreme Court and High Courts are restricting the limits of PIL. Judiciary has become more open. Concept of justice at doorstep encouraged. Lok Adalat, where so many PT issues are solved by the courts and administration on Sunday in a very relaxed environment. Special courts to dispose of PT offenses and evening courts started in many states. So, that uh, more and more cases can be decided quickly. Okay. So, this is all about I believe that civil and criminal what I am trying to say final thing that as a business student, business manager if you understand basics of civil and criminal court, civil and criminal laws, the procedure then you can talk to your legal manager and compliance officer more effectively in your professional life as well as your personal life. So, knowing the law, knowing the system, knowing the procedure will help you to become more empowered, knowledgeable citizen and smart employee to protect the interest of your company. Thank you very much.